Good afternoon. It's Jeff Christian of CPM Group. It's about 1.30 on Wednesday, the 24th of May. Uh, we are recording this today because we have travel schedules and other schedules that will probably preclude us making a video easily on Friday morning. I wanted to talk about something that is not really precious metals. I do have one slide about silver use in solar panels uh, that you'll find interesting if you're a precious metals person or a silver person. Uh, but I wanted to talk about the energy transition and CPM Group's analysis, which has been kind of unique, although there's a consensus now moving in our direction. We have been saying for some time, the energy transition is coming. You're seeing it already in solar power. It's slower in wind power and electric vehicles, but that the transition will be much slower than many people suggest or expect. Uh, and there are a variety of reasons why we think that the transition, especially when it comes to electric vehicles and some of the other technologies, will be slower than expected. Uh, I gave a presentation at the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada annual conference in Toronto in March called a realistic assessment of the energy transition and metal requirements. This is a much longer uh, presentation, uh, went into greater detail and everything from lithium and cobalt and manganese to platinum group metals use in energy technologies going forward over the next 30 years, and silver. Um, there is one chart that I used, and I wanted to share it with you. It's a kind of a difficult technical one because be, it's interactive and it, you have to stop. I want to stop it and, and pause it and talk about it, and that, that might be a little bit cumbersome, but we'll see how it goes, okay? Um, so I, initially, I was just going to use that one slide, and then as I started to do it, I wound up adding other slides too. So let's jump in and talk about the energy transition and why it is likely to be slower than many people would have us expect. First off, clean energy technologies are not created equal. Solar power is here and now. It's growing, it's established, it's economically viable, it's environmentally positive. It uses silver, which is amply in ample supply uh, and affordable. Um, and it's what the IEA says, fully funded. People understand, investors and, and other sources of financing understand the economics of solar. They're willing to finance it. Wind power is being established. It's economically viable. It's facing a lot of NIMBY headwinds, which are really offensive intellectually and ethically, but that's the nature of the world. It's environmentally positive. It uses molybdenum and copper and steel and a variety of other things, uh, including some metals that, you know, for example, molybdenum, we're going to have to mine more molybdenum in the future in order to, comp uh, uh, to, to, to meet the molybdenum requirements both for existing energy technologies, it's used, uh, molybdenum steel is used in drill pipes and in transmission pipes for oil and gas, and for new energy technologies like windmills, because those towers have to be really strong and corrosion resistant uh, for a long period of time. Hydrogen is waiting for liquid organic hydrogen carriers um, to make it safe and cheap to ship, store, and distribute. It's potentially devastating to the PGM market. It's potentially de devastating to a lot of industries because a hydrogen engine that just, you know, an internal combustion engine that's burning hydrogen instead of petroleum products uh, would be half the price to make as an ICE engine that uh, burns petroleum products. It would be about a tenth of the price of a battery pack for an electric vehicle and about 3% of the cost of a fuel cell for a fuel cell vehicle. So if you can get liquid organic hydrogen carriers safely shipping, storing, and distributing hydrogen using the existing infrastructure that has been put in place, you save 
literally $50 trillion just in the United States in terms of not having to build a hydrogen distribution system. Um, and it really would be great. Then you have to figure out where you're going to get your hydrogen from because right now most hydrogen is made as a byproduct of oil and gas industries. Electric vehicles, they're emerging. 10% of light duty vehicles last year were electric vehicles. It's growing, it's probably somewhere between 11 and 13% this year. They are facing many constraints, which I'll talk about in a second. And they're less environmentally green than presently perceived by many people, creating the risks of consumer and social and political backlash as uh, societal forces start by saying, hey, you know, why are we spending twice as much for an electric vehicle? And all we're really doing is shifting where we're burning the coal or the hydrocarbons. Fuel cells, technologically and economically, they're just not viable, except in fleet-managed settings, such as intercity buses or airport tarmacs and warehouses, and in stationary sites. So not all clean energy technologies are created equal, and not all will emerge at the same pace. Now, we've heard a lot of talk about how solar panels are growing. And yes, they used about 120 million ounces of silver last year. They're probably going to use about 128 million ounces this year. Uh, they are not going to use 800 million ounces of silver the way some silver promoters have you think. They, our expectation is that by uh, 2032, 10 years from now, uh, you might be seeing around 185 million ounces of silver being used in solar panels. But it is there. It's growing. It's gone from zero to 120 over the last 20 years, 22 years, and it's going to continue to grow. EVs will be delayed and unpredictable. There are a lot of reasons. I've talked about them in the past. There's a lack of electricity generating capacity and the capital and time to build it the lack of stable electricity distribution grids, and the lack of capital and time to build them, the lack of capital, which leads to the lack of minerals and metals and motors and controllers and other component trees, and the capital and time to build them, and the uncertainty over which technologies will be used, which compounds that capital hesitancy. All of which doesn't say that you won't see a movement continuing toward electric vehicles taking larger number of vehicles and a larger share of the light duty vehicle market. What it says is it's going to take a lot longer than a lot of people would have you believe. We're not going to have 50% of the light duty vehicles electric by 2030. We're not going to have 100% by 2035. Um, in fact, the IEA and CPM group and others think that by 2050, you might have 50% of the vehicles being electric vehicles or hydrogen engines, which may come along uh, sometime beyond 2030. And there's more. I mentioned earlier the potential for consumer backlash. If there comes to be a more accurate and honest assessment that what you're doing is the carbon reduction benefits of electrification electric vehicles are relatively low, especially if you continue to burn oil, natural gas, and coal to, to generate that electricity. Where are you going to get the electricity? There's going to be a shift in the locale of the carbon dioxide generation. Instead of carbon dioxide being generated by vehicles, it'll be generated by the power plants that make the electricity and they won't be in the city, they'll be out someplace where other people have to deal with the, uh, the exhaust and fumes. There's a massive reluctance to understand and focus on the modern day nuclear power technologies. And nuclear power is pretty much dead in the water in the United States and Europe and Japan. It's growing in India and China and some other countries, including some GCC countries. Um, there's the cost to consumers, industries, and government and society, which are really unknown and underplayed by governments and other promoters of the energy transition. And yes, there's an anti-mining and there's anti-windmills, NIMBY issues, which will also uh, prove to be head headwinds. These are the IEA's projections for where 
humankind will get its energy between now and 2050. And you can see the red line is oil. And the IEA says in 2050, oil will still be our major source of energy. Natural gas will be close to matching oil. All renewables combined will be third place, having replaced coal as the number three source of uh, power um, energy sometime after 2040. Nuclear is kind of dead line, uh, red line uh, at, the, at the bottom there. The dashed line is the carbon dioxide intensity. This is all under what is known as the stated policies. This is if things continue the way they have over the last 10 years and going forward and the policies that are in place by governments and businesses continue along the lines of what they have been doing since the Paris Accord, this is where you're going to be. And you can see the carbon dioxide intensity falls from, from 2010 until 2050, but it's still very high. I think that leads us to the chart I want, and you're going to have to bear with me. I think I know how to do this now. And this should be bringing in, okay. This is the policy and technology progress since 2015 Paris Accord. And what's happened since then has shaved a degree, one degree centigrade off of projected warming, off of projected warming, not actual warming between 2015 and now, but what is projected between now and 2050. These are gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions. Those orange things are the pre-Paris baseline. This is where we thought we would be before the Paris Accord. And I think, let me see, again, let me see what I can do in terms of playing with this. I guess I'm not going to try that. Um, the blue part is the stated policies. The policies that have been in place for the last eight years since the Paris Accord, this is where will be in terms of carbon dioxide reduction, emission reductions by 2050, given the way the world has been going. Let's see if I can do the next one. Okay, here you have the in yellow, the announced pledges scenarios. This is if governments and corporations lived up to what they said they would do in 2015 and subsequently. This is the carbon dioxide reduction. And then the last one, if I can do this. That is the net zero emissions by 2050. You can see the stated policies. That's the most likely to occur. Unless you have this really blind optimism about human nature. It's far above what's the stated, what the, has been pledged to be done. And it's way, 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 way above net zero emissions by 2050. So that's not to say that we won't make progress. We're just going to make pathetically small progress that is woefully inadequate to reverse the climate change problems that we're having. So I thought that was pretty cute. IEA, you can go to their website and find that chart. Bottom line, uncertainty is the key to the future of motive propulsion technology. You have to listen to independent, non-conflicted, knowledgeable authorities. Too many groups have positions that they're promoting, prognosticating lithium and cobalt and rare earth demand growth and copper growth. You have to be careful about people who are telling you what they hope happens versus people who are telling you what they think is most likely to happen. Politicians speak about aspirational goals and regulations that cannot technologically be reached. So you have in Europe and you have in other places people saying, well, we're going to get rid of all petroleum-powered vehicles by 2030 or 2035. And that just is unrealistic, both on an economic and a technological basis. And yeah, We've been around. I wrote a newsletter called EV Focus in 1978 about electric vehicles. I wrote a book about electric vehicles in 1979. 
I was doing oil and gas research starting in 1975. I was doing alternative energy technology research starting in 1977-78. So we've been around, we've seen the optimism. You know, the, uh, when we wrote these things in the 1970s, the expectation or the projections of some people were that you could have 400,000 electric vehicles on the road by 1980, 1984. Um, and I think we did get to 400,000 vehicles probably around 2020. We're up around uh, 12 million electric vehicles being built and sold worldwide each year, half of which are being sold in China. That's all I have for today. I uh, hope you find it interesting, insightful, something to think about if you're in the United States and have a long weekend. Uh, you can go to our website, read about our, our, our thoughts on other things, buy some of our reports. And you can send us uh, requests for information at info at cpmgroup.com if you want to learn more about ways that we can help you manage your commodities exposure. Thank you. Have a good day. Take care of yourself, those around you, and try to do something good for the world.